thank you for all that you've given us, especially the pathway to heaven, to be with you for all eternity. Be with us here as we live our lives here on earth to fulfill the mission that Christ was given by you for the salvation of souls. May we see the face of Christ and all those that we encounter, especially those that we don't know, to help them in their salvation as well. And we ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. In the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. So, I'm not going to make you wait until the end of the presentation. So I'm going to give you a little spoiler alert right now. All right? This is where you want to go when you die. This is the good one. All right? This is our goal. Spoiler alert. All right? For, so tonight we're going to talk about heaven. The eternal reward for those who live a good and righteous life in the image and likeness of God, fulfilling what he has endowed us to do for our salvation uh, now and forever. So... Oh, sorry. Better? Okay. So first, before we get to heaven, I want to go to a little something we talked about, we touched on last night. Uh, a word about limbo. No. No. So, what do I mean by that? So limbo is not an official teaching of the church, okay? It is a theory. It is a theory that's actually been around for uh, several centuries to answer one question. What happened to the souls of those unbaptized and in particular, particularly those children who were not baptized before their death? And so the church and theologians struggled with this, and this theory of limbo came about. But it has never been a teaching of the church. It is permitted to be believed, but it is not a teaching. It is simply a theory. And I would hedge to say that it became a very popular theory, particularly when the mortality rate was so high amongst infants, for the grief of parents to understand what had happened to the souls of their children that died in infancy. But it is not an official teaching of the church. It is on par, if you will, this is going to sound a little crazy, with evolution. The church accepts the theory of evolution with the major change of removing nature and putting in God as the change. Okay, so that can animals and species develop over millennia to adapt to their uh, environment? Yes, that's a potential theory. But instead of saying nature did it, God did it. And that would be an acceptable theory of understanding. So the same thing here with limbo. Neither one of those is a teaching of the church, but properly understood is an acceptable theory. Unlike this, because a lot of this stuff was was um, spoken about during uh, the Second Vatican Council, and this is actually where um, the council actually declared that this is not a teaching of the church. During the Second Vatican Council, this was spoken about. What was reinforced, and is, and has been, and will be, the teaching is purgatory. Okay? Purgatory did not go out with Vatican II. I mean, I wish I had a dollar for everyone. Do we still teach that? Do we still believe that? We never stopped. Did we stop talking about it? Yes, unfortunately. But it never ceased being a doctrine of the church. And purgatory, you know, again, in the analogy world, is the... Uh, antechamber to heaven, the, the, uh, the purification chamber, those that are bound and guaranteed eternal salvation in the kingdom of heaven, but are not perfect at the moment of their death. That something, some venial sins, something, where they had not paid for their temporal sins, 
Some way they're not perfect. So the cleansing fire is a purgatory. Where, how, how long, we don't know. That we don't know. But there is scriptural reference, and going from that tradition from the very beginning, that those who would die in God's grace would not the perfect essence go to purgatory. Go to purgatory. It is no longer, I would argue, a well understood uh, doctrine or spoken about. Uh, though for centuries this was a big, big understanding. And so my personal devotion uh, is because when I came back to the church uh, through St. Nicholas of Tolentine Church in Atlantic City, St. Nicholas of Tolentine, the first Augustinian saint declared by the church, is the patron saint of the Holy Souls of Purgatory. And his story is, I believe he, he was alive in the mid-14th century, um, he, he was a friar, his brother had died, and in his sleep, in his sleep, his brother came to him that he was in purgatory. He, was, he needed release from purgatory, and to please pray for him and say a mass for him. And so St. Nicholas, upon his waking up, went and said a mass every day for the repose of his soul, his brother. And then soon afterwards, his brother came back to him in a dream, and was released. And so he, from that, uh, a cult developed around him, a good cult. Um, we are a cult, and that, we have to understand it. As Catholics, any group that does things repetitively for a purpose in a religious form is a cult. We are a cult, but a good one. <laughs> so, uh, so purgatory is an understanding that those not in this perfect state of grace, but guarantee eternal salvation, first go through purgatory, and you'll see, this is the prayer card that St. Nick's used to give out in Atlantic City, and it was the priest saying the Mass for the Holy Souls of Purgatory in the bottom left, and as you can see, it looks like us to be hell, right? That's always the way it's imagined as the cleansing fire, and the angels from heaven with each mass coming down and drawing them up. So there's a big devotion. Um, you'll go, if you go to the, uh, uh, there's several churches, even in the United States. Philadelphia has a St. Nicholas of Tolentine Church. Uh, the Bronx, Atlantic City, anywhere there was pretty much Augustinians, St. Nicholas of Tolentine was a big, uh, map, a big church for them uh, because he was their first in purgatory uh, and the praying for the souls was a major thing for the church, still. So, purgatory or the final purification, right? Purification. God wants only the perfects before him in the beatific vision. So the purification. All who die in God's grace and friendship. Friendship is going to become a big theme tonight. Friendship. Both. Understanding what that means, what that definition means. This is again, the official church teaching uses grace and friendship. But still imperfectly purified are indeed assured their eternal salvation, but after death they undergo purification so as, as to achieve the holiness necessary to enter the joy of heaven. Perfect. Be as perfect as your Father in heaven is perfect. Then you will see him in the beatific vision. The church gives the day of purgatory to its final purification of the elect, which is entirely different from the punishment of the damned. Okay? In our, in our minds, uh, mind's eye, when seeing it, it might look like hell, quote unquote, but it is a purification, not a punishment. Purification, not a punishment. The Church formulated her doctrine of faith on purgatory, especially at the councils of Florence and Trent. The tradition of the Church, by reference to certain texts of Scripture, speaks of a cleansing fire. So with the Church, as we talked about in the past, the Church history, right? So when we say that it was defined, okay, at Florence and then Trent, so Trent is the 1540s, 
Florence, I believe, was in the 1200s. That means that they defined it. They made it official and put it on paper. Not that they just like developed it there. It had always been taught, but never had to be put down on paper because it was just accepted. And usually they define things when they're having problems with it. When people are starting to question it, people are starting to teach heretical ideas. Then the church goes, okay, let's get together. Boom, this is the definition. That's typically the purpose of councils. They don't just make it up. They define it to make it official. This is where the church stands and why. As for certain lesser faults, we must believe that before the final judgment, there is a purifying fire. Purifying, purifying, purifying. Fire, fire, fire. He who is true says that whoever utters blasphemy against the Holy Spirit will be pardoned neither in this age nor the age to come. Right? Remember that. That is the unforgivable sin, to blaspheme against the Holy Spirit. That's the one thing, the absolute denial of God's ability to work within us for the salvation of souls. The absolute denial of God. That is to blaspheme the Holy Spirit. Not to not believe in God as an intellectual understanding, but truly, truly in your heart of hearts, not believe that God can work among us for the salvation of souls. That cannot be forgiven. From this sentence, we understand that certain offenses can be forgiven in this stage, but certain others in the age to come. So we might be forgiven of a mortal sin, okay, forgiven, but we still haven't paid our due. Okay, so we're forgiven of it, but we still might not have paid our due. That's where purgatory comes in. That's where purgatory comes in. It's a cleansing fire. It's not a good place necessarily. There's still a cleansing of it. And so we might have committed such a sin that we've not paid what is due. We were forgiven, but not fully paid our due. But yet are still guaranteed the kingdom of heaven. If you don't repent for a mortal sin that you know of, then this ain't happening. Right? So to go with this, to go with purgatory, here we go for praying for the dead, right? Because we believe that there's this possibility that our loved ones, their souls could be in purgatory. We don't know. We don't know. And so we as Catholics pray for the dead and offer the mass, the ultimate prayer for the repose of their souls. This is something that we are distinctive about, okay? This comes from Maccabees, and for most denominations of Protestants, they don't believe in this. They don't believe in purgatory, so you get rid of Maccabees, because that's where it's referenced from Scripture, the, the, the praying for the dead. So if you don't agree with it, boom, you get rid of the book. This is not the revealed Word of God. The teaching is also based on the practice of prayer for the dead, already mentioned in sacred scripture. Therefore, Judas Maccabeus made atonement for the dead that they might be delivered from their sin. He was a general. His men had died on the battlefield. And those that died, he prayed for their souls. So we have this in the revealed word of God. And if we believe that it is the revealed word of God, then there's a meaning behind his action. And so... We understand that there is purgatory, that there are souls there, and that they need to be released. We don't know how long they go. It, again, time and space ceases upon our death. From the beginning, the church has honored. From the beginning, right? Tradition, big T. Tradition, big T. It may not be specifically spelled out in Scripture, but we as Catholics believe that revelation comes from Scripture and tradition, meaning that from the beginning, the church taught this, believed it, and taught it. So you'll hear, where is that in Scripture? And then we have to go, it's not there. See, it's made up, man me. They have no concept of understanding tradition, big T. 
because when they think tradition, oh, it's what we do. It's what we've done, you know, the Italians do this, the Germans do that. No, 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 no. Those are customs. Tradition, big T, is from the beginning, those who encountered Christ and handed on the faith believed this and taught it. Remember, Scripture itself is a tradition because it was written 30 years after the resurrection. The first 30 years of our faith was based on the oral tradition. They didn't have the Bible. They literally did not have the Bible. They had the inspired word from the experience of the apostles. And so we believe based on that and revealed uh, revelation through sacred scripture that we have big T tradition. And some of our teachings come from that. But it's very hard for the church to justify this because we can't point at it in the Bible. And so for a lot of Protestants, will go, that's just made up. It's not. It's revealed. The church also commends almsgiving, indulgences, and works of penance undertaken on behalf of the dead. Let us help and commemorate them. If Job's son were, sons were so purified by their father's sacrifice, why would we doubt that our offering for the dead bring them some less consolation? Let us not hesitate to help those who have died and to suffer and to offer our prayers for them. So always, 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 always pray for those who have died. Pray for those who have died. Because the prayers will not go on wasted. If they have already, if they were in purgatory and have gone on, the prayers will be applied to others. No prayer ever goes unwasted, just like no mass goes ever unwasted. So there, these are good things for us to do, to pray for the repose of the souls of the dead. So just a personal note. So this is St. Nicholas of Tallentine. This was the church I came back to. <laughs> I thought they were all like this. Uh, found out that the hard way. Um, so this is Atlantic City on Pacific Ave, uh, and this is the main Riridos. Uh The Riridos, uh was the main centerpiece, the main altar for all churches throughout the world up through the early 1930s. Basically with the hit of the Great Depression, uh, churches could no longer build it like this. And so the, the cost, this is all marble. Uh, you know, these are all handcrafted. So with the onslaught of the Great Depression, World War II, by the 1950s, these were out. They were simply too expensive. And in this country in particular, um, as people started moving out of the cities, they had to build bigger, quicker churches with less cost. And so you'll see a typical uh, post-war pre-Vatican Council mm -hmm. church uh, will be more rectangular. Okay, so it's square, uh, rectangular with a uh, more of a baldacchino rather than a reredos. So this reredos um, are very few churches today built from the ground up. Having said that, the new trend, okay, is that when newer churches are renovated, we go and buy these from churches that are closed. Yeah, so a lot of people will, a lot of uh, uh, churches that are conducive to it architecturally, um, in Philly, in New York, in Boston, they'll actually, the diocese has closed the church, they still have it, they can actually take these apart, store them, and then sell them. And so there are churches throughout the United States that have repurposed, if you will, Reredos. They're the new trend back. But to do this by hand today, can't. Um, if you really want a spectacular one in our own diocese, about 40 minutes north here from here, in the city of Trenton itself, at St. Hedwig's. Has anyone ever been there? It's a Polish parish. Now there's a Reredos. Like it's huge. Makes St. Nick's look small. So. Uh, it is, it's, but it's an amazing church. If you're in Atlantic City, I'm sure some of you are, uh, <laughs> check it out on Sunday, on Saturday evening for Mass. Uh, but this is where I came back and really uh, uh, had a devotion and developed a devotion to the Holy Souls of Purgatory. 
to the right here uh, in the uh, baptistry, absolutely gorgeous. It's all mosaic inside, and it was put on during the Great Depression. And then this is probably my favorite story I was saying next. Just blows my mind because if I ever try to do this today as a priest, I think any parish would just run them out. During the 1930s, St. Nick's was gonna close, right? Atlantic City depended on tourists. During the Great Depression, no one's going on vacation, right? So they, were getting, they had nobody coming to the shore, and so the Augustinians were gonna close this huge church, hold to a thousand people. And so the word went out, so they put out the word, asking all the Catholics on the Absecon Island and on the mainland, again, at the height of the Great Depression, if you want us to stay open, give us your excess gold and jewelry so we can sell it. <coughs> the response was so overwhelming with the amount in the Great Depression that the excess gold and diamonds and rubies were melted down and made into a four and a half foot tall monstrance. It, it's tall. Solid white gold, diamonds, rubies, all over. That was the excess of what people gave during the Great Depression to keep that church open. Tell me how it would go if I asked that today. <laughs> or any parish, right? Different mentality. I mean, people were, this was their church. And uh, St. Nick's was the Irish church, right? St. Michael's was the Italian church. St. Uh, uh, Our Lady of the Sea was the poorer Irish. And then St. Monica's was the black Catholic church in Atlantic City. So four churches in Atlantic City at one point, divided by ethnicity and race. Okay, so what is heaven? What are we going for? Those who die in God's grace and friendship. Heard that again, friendship, right? Relationship. Relationship, communion, that's the whole point of heaven, to be in full relationship, in full communion with God. Which goes back to what we said on the first night, one of our unique aspects is that we are made for communion. Communion with God and with others. And that's literally our end goal. The ultimate communion is to be with God forever. So that is what we're aiming for and are perfectly purified, live forever with Christ. They are like God forever, for they see Him as He is face to face, the beatific vision. That is what we call, when we are before God, the beatific vision. What exactly that looks like? Hopefully I'll find out, well, not soon. <laughs> in, a, in, a, in a much further future. So this here in the middle, the blue here, and it's all in, your, uh, in the package tonight, this is the official, the official definition of heaven as per the church. It was accepted in 1335, I think was the date for this passage, okay? By virtue of our apostolic authority, this was defined by a pope and then um, uh, passed by a council. We define the following, according to the general disposition of God, the souls of all saints and other faithful who died after receiving Christ's body, Christ's holy baptism, provided they were not in need of purification when they died, purgatory, or if they then did need or will need some purification, when they have been purified after death, already before they have taken up their bodies again and before the general judgment, and this, since the ascension of our Lord Jesus Christ into heaven, have been and will be in heaven, in the heavenly kingdom and celestial paradise with Christ, joined to the company of the holy angels. 
since the passion and death of our Lord Jesus Christ, these souls have seen and do see the divine essence with an intuitive vision and even face to face without the mediation of any creature. One on one, nothing in between. No creature, which includes angels, which includes anything that God's created. When you are in the beatific vision, you are literally before God. This is why you have to be perfect. This is what we literally live for. This perfect life with the most blessed Trinity, Holy Trinity, this communion of life and love with the Trinity, with the Virgin Mary, the angel and all the blessed is called heaven. Heaven is the ultimate end and the fulfillment of the deepest human longings, the state of supreme, definitive happiness. Now when I start my class at Holy Cross with my kids, and I teach morals, I, I show them a video of a young monk who says it's called, God doesn't care about your happiness. Happiness as people understand it today. He doesn't care about that. When he says happiness, this is what he's talking about. In our culture today, happiness is sex, power, material wealth, titles, all those. Those are fleeting happiness. Those are not true happiness. And so that's what the video is to tell these kids. That means nothing. Nothing. This is the happiness that we're seeking, and we desire, and we live for it. For life is to be with Christ. Where Christ is, there is life. There is the kingdom. Boom. That's it. Sums up right there. So what is heaven? It is being with God in perfect communion and perfect happiness for all eternity. No pain, no suffering, nothing but pure joy and happiness. Something that we cannot even actually fully conceive. We don't have the ability to conceive this fully. But we have the ability to desire it. To desire it and live towards it. Now having said that, one question that pops up a lot. Does how you die affect your judgment? Does how you die in a horrific car accident, long battle of cancer, anything like that, who thinks that affects their judgment, their particular judgment? That's right, it doesn't. No. How you die makes no difference. What is on your soul does. So you have mortal sin, mortal sin, mortal sin, and you die in a horrific car accident, they don't cancel out. They don't cancel out. Even if you suffer in a long battle against cancer, horrific ending here to the human body, that doesn't negate if you didn't seek God's mercy, if you didn't seek repentance, if you just suffered bodily pain, that doesn't negate your sins. So this is why I said yesterday, be prepared. How one dies does not directly affect their judgments. So if you die suddenly in any which way, that is not accounted. Yes? I'm gonna throw a right What if you give your life for somebody? So, okay. So, that was, on those kind of cases, you, we leave that up to the hands of God, okay? So we cannot definitively say, automatically, salvation, okay? Yes, if you give your life for somebody, and it's truly something that could not be avoided, because even God, He doesn't want us to put our lives at stake, unless it's the ultimate, truly no other uh, way about it. But again, this is why in the end, it's God's judgment call. He knows everything. 
But what I don't want is people to go, oh, he died a tragic death. He must be in heaven. Right? We've got to be very careful of that, that we don't think that how we die means that they're saved or not. Or, look at the way he died. Oh, God must have been mad. You know? No. we got to be very careful with that. Be very, very careful with that. Yes? Absolutely, what we're called to do, and also, also, if a priest is not available, right, one can do an honest, full-hearted act of contrition, and it is effective. Okay, that prior to one's death, if the priest is not there, if you're on a place where the priest is a hundred miles away, and they can't get to you, if the person does an honest act of contrition because of the unability of a priest to get there again god knows whether you're saying the words or meaning it okay just because we say words doesn't mean anything what's the intention and the heartfelt understanding behind it he's the one that knows that question yeah Well, I mean, again, I, I, I don't know too much about it, to be quite honest. I don't want to speak incorrectly. I know we have the ability as to, does that automatically erase everything? I'd have to double check. I don't want to say the wrong thing, the apostolic blessing, um, which actually came up recently when I got stuck in the elevator. My, my other priest wanted me to do that. I'm like, I don't plan on dying, so let's not go there. We're just stuck in an elevator. Here. Calm down. So, we're only like four stories up. If either went down, we weren't dying. Maimed, maybe, but not dying. Okay. Yeah, I'm sorry. Yep. Right. scapular or anything like that. We've got to be very careful about understanding of protecting us, right? It is meant to help us live uh, righteous lives and to remind us of the, the promises and what it means to be a disciple of Christ, but it's not a uh, uh, lucky charm. Yeah, it's not a uh, blockage. Or, you know, like, you got to be very, very careful about any of those things that we use that, oh, it, you know, if I do this, I'll be protected, you know, or if I wear this, it's blessed, I'll be protected. How we live, how we live, and how we reflect the image and likeness of God, that is how we are judged. They will help with our reminder of living that. Yes. A lot of times I see it when someone's really sick. Right. Nothing supersedes the, the sacraments, particularly the Eucharist and uh, confession. Um, but we just got to be very careful how we understand it. Oh, if I wear this now, I can do whatever I want, and I'm good. That's not, okay. not what it means. If they're in the state of grace. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, they got to be in the state of grace. So, okay, so, just moving on again, the catechism, these are all official teachings of the church that are in the notes for you tonight. By his death and resurrection, Christ opened heaven to us. Like I said last night, right, prior to the resurrection, all souls went to Sheol because there was no literal path 
to the kingdom of heaven. So through his resurrection and ascension, he quote unquote opened heaven to us. Opened heaven to us. The life of the blessed consists in the full and perfect possession of the fruits of redemption accomplished by Christ. He makes partners in his heavenly glorification those who have believed in him and remained faithful to his will. Believed and remained faithful. How we act, how we talk, how we think. Not by just faith alone. Heaven is the blessed community of all who are perfectly incorporated into Christ. Community and incorporation. Right? We're all talking about community. We're meant for be, to be in community with each other. Particularly with God. Literally incorporated into Christ. Incorporated into Christ. This mystery of blessed communion with God and all who are in Christ is beyond all understanding and description. So for 2,000 years, we have been trying to explain this from an official point of view, from an art point of view, from a verbal point of view, and none of it actually measures up to what it really is. That's the point. It's beyond us. It's beyond us. Scripture speaks in images of light, life, peace, wedding feast, wine of the kingdom, the Father's house, the heavenly Jerusalem, paradise. But in the end, as Paul tells us, no eye has seen nor ear heard or heart of man conceived what God has prepared for those who love him. We can draw all we want. We can make songs all we want, write poems all we want. None of it actually compares to what heaven really is, which is pretty cool, right? Think of the most beautiful piece of artwork that you can think of that's portrayed heaven, and it's well beyond that. Anything you can conceive of, heaven is beyond that. Because of his transcendence, this is one of the first words I make my kids learn about God. Transcendence. Above. Beyond. All encompassing. He is our creator, our redeemer, and our judge. Everything above us. We can never put ourselves on par. When we do, we fail. He is transcendent above everything that we can ever conceive and do. God cannot be seen as he is unless he himself opens up his mysteries to man's immediate contemplation and gives him the capacity for it. The church calls this contemplation of God in his heavenly glory the beatific vision. And that can only happen when we've left this earthly world. When we've left this earthly world. How great will your glory and happiness be to be allowed to see God, to be honored, with sharing the joy of salvation and eternal life with Christ, your Lord and God, to delight in the joy of immortality in the kingdom of heaven with the righteous and God's friends. God's friends. That's the kind of word the church officially uses. Our friendship, total communion with God in the kingdom of heaven. And who is the ultimate example of that? Blessed Mother. The Blessed Mother. So from Catholic.com, great article by Tim Staples. Each person will see or comprehend God in the beatific vision in accordance with his own capacity dictated to him by his state of grace at the moment of his death. This state of grace is determined by both the gift of God and the degree to which he has been blessed in cooperating with the grace during his earthly sojourn. How much do we cooperate with God's grace. The example, the example par excellence, of this truth is found in the Mother of God. No member of the body of Christ will see or comprehend God to the degree Mary does, because she has given the greatest gifts of grace among all mankind. While at the same time, no human person ever cooperated with the grace of God as perfectly as Mary did. Mary, the Blessed Mother, is the most perfect perfect human being ever created. With this understanding, we can under, with this understanding, we can understand why the church teaches heaven to be primarily a state rather than a place. 
a state of being, a state of being, not a place. You can't travel up there to heaven. And the beatific cannot, vision cannot be understood as people being in heaven, looking over there and seeing God. And if they look away, look away from over there, they don't see God anymore. The blessed will be in the state of comprehension of God that is constant, everlasting, eternal. They can't leave heaven and go back to heaven precisely because heaven is principally a state of being. It's a state of being, not a place. But the Blessed Mother is literally the best human being that we can turn to as an example. She gave the ultimate yes to conceive Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, and stayed with him to the very end. As all the others ran away, she was with him to the very end. So she is the best example that we can turn to to live up to the type of discipleship of Christ. So here's another question. Does marriage exist in heaven? Now some people are saying, I hope not. No. Um, <laughs> But literally, when we say the different versions, death to us part. At the moment of death of one of the spouses, that covenant no longer exists. That covenant no longer exists. And so, within the kingdom of heaven, there is no marriage, right? Because, to put it bluntly, if you're before God, love your spouse as you might, God is God. You're going to be focused, if you will, on God. Okay? You're going to be literally focused on God. But that doesn't mean that we don't have that relationship, that friendship still. This is what John Clark says from the National Catholic Register. St. Thomas Aquinas provides an answer to this question in the Summa Theologia, in the section on happiness. True happiness, not superficial happiness. Thomas says that love of others in heaven results from the perfect love of God. While our perfect happiness is not contingent on the presence of others, Thomas writes that friendship is, as it were, concomitant, which both means goes with naturally, with perfect happiness. Thus, rather than an indifference to others in heaven, the friendship among and between all those in heaven including those who receive the sacrament of matrimony together, accompanies, <coughs> accompanies perfect happiness. You will be in perfect happiness with all that are there. But the actual matrimony dissolves upon death. So, in the end, literally in the end, Heaven is our goal, plain and simple. This is the culmination of our faith. God has created us to share eternal communion with Him. In other words, happier are those who die in a state of sanctifying grace and who are thus assured heaven. And the reason I chose this image, right, and using going on with our goal is to be with God in heaven. But the only thing that stops us is our sin. That's who the goal is. That's our sin. We are bound for heaven until we sin and we don't repent. So God knows what he's asking for us is tough, but he gives us the tools, the church, the sacraments to reconcile with him and get that goal back on path. So, before we go, I know it's getting a little hot in here, just want to show you a few traditional images of how heaven has been depicted. This is probably from medieval period, I would say. Uh, and in all the pictures, Christ is always in the center up. Always center up. Christ is the center. Here he shares the center with the Blessed Mother. A lot of times in churches, you'll see a kind of vertical movement. 
of judgment. But then the Trinity is, is usually uh, um, uh, shown in the center, going up. And then finally in Vajray tonight, it's not the best. Has anyone been to Florence? Okay, this is the Duomo, okay? From this ledge here to the ledge up top, it's 140 feet. Okay, so this is a tunnel, this is the dome going up, and it's the levels of hell, purgatory, heaven. And if you go up the Duomo, which I've done, right, you go in the middle of the walls first, and then you come out along this ledge right here. So you're looking, right here would be the wall with the painting of all the devils and all the damned. Okay, right at eye level, right at eye level. And then you go through a door, and the only way this was, could be built, this was built in the 1540s, okay, is that there's an inner dome and the outer dome that we all see. And what happens is you walk on the outside of the inner dome. So below your feet is this fresco, and then there's a dome behind you for the outer part of the building. Absolutely magnificent. Absolutely magnificent. But just the artwork alone, and again, Christ in the center, up. Even in the dome. But the damned, or as you can see, the colors and the reds, right? Getting lighter and lighter and lighter to purification. Christ in the center. So, again, in my humble opinion, this is what's been lost in a lot of our churches, as a lot of the artwork and a lot of the imagery has been removed to make it more practical and cheap. For, uh, but a lot of the meaning has been drawn out as well. So I really hope that there'll be. Um, Revitalization of a lot of this uh, in our churches in the future because people are visual. It helps us to see. It helps us to understand uh, the good and the bad. So your goal is heaven. It's not guaranteed. It's a gift. And remember, a gift is offered, received, and accepted, and then shared. And that's what we're called to do for salvation. To, all, to accept it, receive it, accept it, and then share with others through our lives. So, any questions tonight on heaven? Don't ask me who's there. I don't know. <laughs> Except for the book of saints that we know. Any questions on... on yeah? Father, this is what I'm going to be 